Throughout my adult life, my focus has been on making the world a more beautiful place. Initially, I pursued this goal as a hairstylist, working on the external appearance of individuals to make them feel more beautiful. However, I wanted more, so I began to shift my focus to helping people make better choices and achieve greater beauty from within. As a transformational life coach, I specialize in helping you identify and change the limiting beliefs that may be holding you back. Join me each week as we discuss, interview, teach, and explore the fundamental principles of healthy relationships. Welcome to Conscious Conversations with Louisa. In today's episode of Conscious Conversations with Louisa, I'm speaking with Abraham Heisler. I love the sentence I say all the time is how much more proof do we need? Mm -hmm. Every single time I turn around, there it is. And it's like, again, how much more proof do I need? With that being said, how did you know? How did you know what when you went on to your journey to even hire your first coach? And what was that experience like? Well, I, I mean, I've had a lot of mentors in my life. What put me onto the path of coaching development through coaching program was uh, an organization that I came across because I was looking for support on relationships and intimacy because I was in between my two marriages. So I was married and then I got out of that and I realized, okay, I need to work on myself and my ability to, to relate to women. And so I went to a coaching program and it just blew my mind. And so I went through their sort of six month training and at halfway through, I was like, I need a personal coach. I need to work with somebody one-on-one to learn how to create a business out of this. Cause I always knew that I wanted to facilitate personal growth. I just had no idea what it looked like when I realized, Oh, it's coaching. That's what it is. I realized, okay, I need somebody to kind of walk me through step-by-step. So a friend of mine uh, was crushing it. She was, you know, years ago living in a, a one bedroom apartment, you know, working as a, a high school teacher in New York And all of a sudden she's living in a huge, beautiful house and it's like, you know, doing fancy stuff. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a mindset coach and I I have a mindset coach and I've changed my money story and I'm this. And I was like, okay, we need to talk. So I think when it was that, you know, that personal connection, this is somebody I trust. This is somebody that, you know, I've seen, they've gone through this journey and I want to go through the same journey. And so it was part coaching, but part mentorship. And just to be clear, the distinction, at least for me, between a coach and a mentor, if you look at like Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, if somebody's on a journey to become, you know, a more evolved version of themselves, you have mentors that have gone through that journey and can guide you from, from leading, right? This kind of ties into the previous conversation. Leading, saying, watch this step, watch that step. Whereas a coach, I, the way I see it, can be a mentor, However, it could also be somebody walking alongside of you and pushing you either from the side or maybe even pushing you from behind. You know, think about some of the people who coach football or basketball, whatever it is. Maybe they played in the past. Maybe, you know, Phil Jackson can't dunk like Jordan isn't one of the best players in the game. However, they can coach from the sidelines because they know how to get the best out of you, right? So, so that for me is sort of an important distinction. So I, I signed up with this, this woman. It was a, a very costly program to participate in, and, and it really changed my life. So what would you say was the big takeaway from the relationship coach to getting clarity to what not to do in your... Because one of the things I heard you say is you, your wife plays a huge role in who you are and what you do. And men usually rebel against that. So when I heard you say that, I'm like, oh, he's inviting his wife to participate. And, and there's, there's a beautiful experience there that I heard you say. So oh, yeah. what was one of your takeaways from the relationship coaching to what has impacted your relationship now? Wow. Including um, your wife. Including my wife. How long well, have you I been mean, married? About six years now. Okay. Yeah. I think the main thing is I had very little confidence in myself. And I don't think I could have even attracted her into my life had I not gone through my relationship coaching and training and and working on myself, my confidence, my ability to be 
intimate and to, you know, uh, to, to really meet a partner. And I, I think that's, you know, it's interesting because I always, I see, so we're talking about working with people and obviously mm-hmm. nobody's volunteering here. It's a business, right? And so you, the only way you work with somebody is that is if you enroll them and, and you sell a coaching program or a coaching package. And what's really interesting is for me, the sales process is very similar to dating, right? It's very similar to sex, right? It's a very intimate experience and there's an exchange that happens there. And I was completely lost when it came to money. I was completely lost when it came to owning my personal power. I was a total people pleaser, nice guy, that whole thing. And I was totally lost when it came to intimacy. And so it's like a, a bit of a triad there. I used to do a coaching sort of event in Los Angeles called Money, Sex, and Power for the Spiritually Enlightened which was a lot of fun. So, so what did I learn from my coaching? I think it was how to embrace those parts of me because, you know, it's, it's easy, especially for people that are more conscious to stay in the, the higher ranges of love, peace, and harmony, but we disown our power, our, our sex, our intimacy. We disown money. Oh, it's bad. It's evil. Or I don't, you know, there's all this like shame and taboo stuff around it. And I think what's really The interesting is the relationship coaching allowed me to address all of that. So it wasn't just how do I relate to a woman? It's like, how do I relate to to all of those different energies in my life? Because the way you do anything could be the way that you do everything. And and that's how I was approaching a lot of things in my life was just sort of ignoring it. So by doing that work, by having more confidence, by being able to really be intimate with a partner was what attracted my wife in the first place. But well, what kept us together is the commitment to pers- to grow because the two of us, to be honest, we come from totally different hemispheres. I mean, literally I mean, same hemisphere in the sense of, well, I guess, yeah, Europe's in the same hemisphere as us, right? My, my wife is European. I'm from New York City. So, but she just comes from such a different background than I do. So everything is different. And when we first got together, I mean, it was like passion and this and that, but at the same time, Time, the, the same passion we had in bed, we, it was the same passion we had when we were fighting. And I'd never been in fights like that before in my life. It was scary. But what kept us together was seeing that we're both committed to growing. We're both committed to working on ourselves. We're both committed to truth and to evolving as human beings. And after six years of, of just doing this dance again and again and again, we finally hit this stride where we're partners. I mean, it's more than just you know, passionate lovers, we're also friends, but we're also partners. And when I see that she's not playing full out and showing up as the best she can, I poke and I push and I prod and I, I make sure that she's, you know, doing what she feels she needs to do to be self-expressed. And it's exactly the same for me. So I have, she's watching my back, you know, she's got my six. And, and for me, that just makes the, the relationship so much stronger. So I hope I'm sort of rambling a bit here. I hope this is answering the question. So perfect. It's exactly what I was looking for. And I okay. I love that I actually feel the you hit it, what the men needed to hear and what I, I needed to hear and the women needed to hear in here because I really feel you answered it for both parties perfectly. And I am you know what I love that men have this space where they get to be vulnerable in that area because we're I'm sometimes at fault for expecting mm. men to, you know already know things <laughs> mm. you know it's interesting <laughs> I, I would highly recommend you know definitely for the men but also for the women has anybody here heard of David Data yeah mm-hmm. okay Glenn so this is, this is, there's a sort of there's an author a speaker a coach a, a mentor by the name of David Data. Data is spelled D-E-I-D-A. And he's got a a ton of really good books and and writings and, you know, podcasts and whatnot. But one of his most famous books is called The Way of the Superior Man. And what he talks about is really the relationship between men and women and, and how to really get to that place of passion and excitement where both are playing in, in, in these sort of polarities because the idea being that when we lose our polarity as male, female, and this is actually really, I think, a very timely topic, something that's really important as we're going through all sorts of shifts in, in society. 
But when it comes to the personal level between two people, a male, female, or, or it could be even two men, two women, whenever there is a lack of polarity, there's a lack of dynamicity and the relationship begins to fall very flat. And so what's really important is that there's one person who's really in what he defines as the masculine pole and another person in the feminine pole. And it doesn't have to be male, female. It could be vice versa or it could be, like I said, two men, two women. It doesn't matter. But this is just a human dynamic where when somebody is playing more of that, that sort of masculine role, which means, I'll put it very simply, if, if there's a dance that's happening, let's say, you know, some people are doing a tango on a dance floor, the role of the masculine is to create the dance floor, right? To create the container and the dance is that, that feminine principle. So it's a little abstract here, but you can basically extrapolate it to, to mean that there's, there's that one person that's sort of holding the space while another person is experiencing the dance of life. And oftentimes this, these roles switch. And this is something that we experience in coaching as well, is that you're creating a safe space, a container for your clients to open up and even have that dance. If they don't feel safe, that's not going to happen. And that's another thing I learned from my coach, from my relationship coaching course as well. But all this to say that the reason why I brought this up is because there are these three sort of levels that David Data talks about in relationship. One is a very self-centered, egocentric relationship where it's like, I'm only in it to get my needs met and I don't really care about you, which is unfortunately <laughs> where, you know, a lot of people are. It's like, <laughs> especially narcissistic people, people that are very self-centered and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's a huge thing, right? Unfortunately. And then it's interesting because level two is the, you know, oh, I'm, I want to be very, you know, cognizant of your needs and how can I support you? And, and okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take a step down so that, you know, you know, we can be equal and that I want everything to, you know, like the conscious male, right? The role of this conscious male, this, uh, this sense that like, okay, you know, I, I know that, you know, you're a woman and, and, you know, I want to treat you different than maybe my past generations treated you, which is nice and more evolved conscious wise, but again, it still falls very flat. It's not the ultimate evolution of what a relationship could be. And the third level is, I don't know why I'm teaching all this. <laughs> They're going into this, but for me, for me, it's, it's something exciting. I haven't talked about it in a while, but the third thing is, is where you're so surrendered and so tuned into a higher power and higher purpose that it's almost like, you just you just can tell what the other person needs, even when it's and this is actually I think this is why we're going into it is because in a coaching relationship, you know when somebody's like, yeah, I don't want to really go there, and you know the person is not playing at their highest level, and sometimes the soft the the carrot doesn't work. You got to bring the stick, right? You got to bring the smack down in order for that person to really open up and play at that high, highest level in alignment with purpose, with truth, with power, universe, God, whatever it is that you want to call it. And so, you know, David Data would also say, would often say that third level of relationship is like, you know, I'm going to, part of my French, he'll say, I'm going to fuck you to God, right? <laughs> it's like this powerful extreme of poles where it's just like, you know, this like animalistic instinct also with this aligned sort of, you know, divine consciousness, which some people say, oh, I've gotten to that level, but have you really, you know, it's, it's sort of very difficult to tell who's there, who's not. But I just thought that was a kind of interesting distinction between the three. I love that. And I think that, you know, how, I, I love that you use the carrot and then the stick and how do we know? Because sometimes somebody could be really aggressive in the way that they handle a situation. What's pushing too hard and borderline yeah. abusive? And what's I'm doing it because I love you. Because I know that, you know, we've done transformational courses and sometimes they push and you want to smack the shit out of them. And they're like, I'm oh, doing this for your greatness. And you're in there with, they're doing this for my greatness. So getting my ass handed to me right now must be great. <laughs> then you get married and someone wants to hand their your ass to you. And you're like, is this because he loves me? Like, how do you get that fine line of this is great and this is abuse? 
<laughs> well, this, Louisa, thank you so much because that's the million dollar question. <laughs> I keep asking it. I swear to God, I'm looking for and, an answer. <laughs> and I, I, I don't think I have an answer for you today. Sorry, it's just getting a little hot. I'm turning the fan on. I don't think I have an answer for you today. But what I do have is a model <clears throat> that I think helps to bring more awareness to this question, this situation. And funny enough, you sent me a little note, and I think you said uh-huh. that you wanted me to actually touch on this today. So it's perfect sort of setup for this. There's something that I learned in my first coaching program that really blew my mind and changed my perspective and the way I see myself, the way I see society, the way I see a lot of things. And it's something called the victim triangle, also known as the drama triangle. Dr. Carr, I think it's a psychologist by the name of Carr, came up with this probably like, I can't remember, 60s, 70s. But if you go online, you can look it up. It's called the drama, the dreaded drama triangle or the victim triangle. First off, has anybody heard of this? I've only seen it on your page and I've been like so curious. Yes. Okay, great. Let's go into it. And if if need be, I can whip out a pen and we can kind of diagram it out. I did allow share screen if you need to share anything to access that. But it's, let me see if I can find it real quick. Go ahead. So- so, so here's the thing. This is a dynamic that plays out in our own personal psychology, in our dynamics, interpersonal dynamics, and on a societal level, okay? In between large, I mean, we see this in politics, we see this between countries, everywhere. And it's a sort of cyclic that, that has all three players of this triangle locked into place. And so it starts with a victim. So it means that when you're, I think I'll also just say this, these are also on a sort of maybe more abstract level, these are all different forms of consciousness, right? So the first point, let's say it's victim consciousness. So when you're in your victim consciousness, you feel that Mm -hmm. somebody is taking something away from you or somebody is abusing you. And so to your question, Louisa, which is a perfect question, when is it coming from a place of love? And when is it coming from this? And like, to be honest, we don't know. Like, if you really want to get into a philosophical standpoint, we have no idea. We can infer, but we have no idea. However, what we do have awareness over is our own stuff. And we can tell, am I in a place of victim consciousness or am I in a different level of consciousness, which we're going to get to shortly? So the victim consciousness is a place where you feel robbed, you feel persecuted, you feel un- like unjustly, you know, somebody has infringed something upon you that's not good or not right. Now, obviously in the triangle, there's the, the persecutor, right? There's the person or the thing that's doing this to you. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be COVID, right? It could be, oh, we have a hurricane coming in Florida and now schools are shut down and my daughter's home and now I have to, you know, it's look like, oh, that freaking hurricane is taking away my ability to be free tomorrow. You know, right? now I have to babysit, you know, that's a victim consciousness, for instance. Now we have the victim, we have the persecutor. The third is the rescuer. Okay. Now the rescuer, what's really interesting is that a lot of people have that rescuer dynamic. If you go back to what I was saying about David Data's levels of of relationship consciousness, a lot of conscious guys are at level two, but really what they're playing is rescuer. Let me come and save the situation. Let me do the right thing. Let me help you and help people. And I'm going to, I'm going to help. I'm going to help. And I'm going to save people. I'm going to save the world, right? I'm going to save the earth. So the problem with that is that the victim, this is a a codependent dynamic, the victim relies on the rescuer to come in and to save its butt, okay? So for instance, like a lot of people, you know, when COVID happened and people were complaining, oh, you know, COVID's messing up my business or I'm losing money or I don't know what to do. And then the government started handing out money. Now I took some of that money. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but a lot of, there were people that I've talked to who were like, oh yeah, the government needs to pay me and I have to blah, 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 like demanding that the government now has to take care of me, right? So that's one way it plays out in a sort of political setting. Another way is that, you know, we all see this in families, right? In a few weeks, we're going to go for Thanksgiving if you're in the States. And you're going to see this play out at the dinner table, right? Usually there's a person 
who maybe feels like, oh, you know, mom, you're always on my case. Or this. And then the sister has to come in and defend the other sister. And that dynamic happens for years on end. I mean, is that something that people can relate to? Yes or yes. Have you seen that play out? Yes and yes. Your own self? Mm-hmm. 100%. I, I'll give you one final example. I did a, a mastermind in-person event a couple of years back, and one of my clients got up and was saying, you know, there is this guy that I work with. He's not even a partner. He's my employee, but he's kind of messing things up and he's telling the, our clients the wrong thing and this and that. And it, the question obviously was like, well, if the relationship's not working out, why don't you let him go? And he's like, well, but you know, he's a good guy and he's blah, 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 right. He starts defending why that person should stay. That's his rescuer coming in and trying to save the day and say, well, maybe he's not so bad and maybe it'll get better and trying to make up excuses. Okay. Rather than doing the difficult thing and confronting the fact that this relationship's not working. Now, I'll just move. I mean, obviously, when I teach this, I take like hours to go through all of this and we kind of play it out to really get the sense of it. But I do want to tell you the flip side of this triangle, because that for me is the most inspiring part of it. But before I do, everything I've said so far, is that clear? Do you guys have any questions about that? Or does that make sense? Thumbs up. All good. That is like clearer than crystal. Okay, great. Love it. Beautiful. Now, here's the thing. There's also another triangle called the empowerment triangle or the empowerment dynamic, TED, you can look that up. And that is when we go from a victim disempowered. This is the main thing that we have to really understand is that this is a disempowered state. Now, and I used to, again, I was a filmmaker. I taught film all over the world. Almost every film, if you go and you watch a movie, about 15 minutes into the movie, what we call the inciting incident happens. For instance, Star Wars, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up and says, you got to come with me and join the fight. And what does he say? He's like, oh, you know, I got to take care of my, my plants and my uncle and my aunt. They're going to be worried. and I can't go join the fight. Who am I? Right. And then sure enough, he goes home and his aunt and uncle <laughs> no longer alive. And he realizes that's it. You know, the empire has to pay. And almost every film at that inciting incident point, the character is a victim of some sort of circumstance, right? The character loses something or, you know, the typical Kung Fu movie, you know, the child witnesses his parents getting killed. Now he has to get revenge. It's like, there's always something that's inflicted upon somebody. And then they have to go from from victim to victor, right? So that's like a little interesting aside, but here's the thing, the victim consciousness, the flip side of that, the empowered state of that is what I call the hero and is the creator consciousness. So that's when you realize, for instance, when you take personal responsibility and you tap into your power, you realize, wait a second, I somehow am creating a circumstance. It's not other people that are inflicting their will upon me, right? It's not, you know, the hurricane is making my life bad and there's nothing I can do about it. It's my own mindset. I should be delighted to spend time with my kid. I'm so excited to spend, I get to spend an entire day, two to three days with my daughter. That's beautiful, right? All of a sudden I'm claiming my power. And the one's persecutor, the one that was taking away my power is now the challenger. Meaning I look at challenges, not as you know obstacles that are just trying to keep me down, but obstacles like weights, in a gym that are forcing me to grow, forcing me to get stronger than I am right now so that I can, you know, not only just overcome those challenges, but become the version of myself afterwards. Like what's going to come of this if I can overcome the challenge of, you know, my business isn't working or I need clients or, you know, I have this sickness and I'm finally, you know, developing the immunity to fight that sickness. So to put it more plainly, the, the challenger becomes like a coach, right? The one who's pushing your buttons, doing it from a place of, of, you know, of, of empowerment in their own mind, realizing you have the tools. If, if you're the coachee and I'm the coach, I realize you have it inside of you 
to overcome whatever challenge you're in front of. So I'm going to, I'm not going to force you to do anything, but I'm going to put a certain amount of pressure on you. In fact, I was just thinking about this yesterday. A lot of people talk about, oh, pressure is good and pressure, you know, pressure is good, pressure is bad. Pressure is pressure, right? A grape, you know, needs pressure to, to turn into wine, but it gets crushed, okay? A diamond needs pressure to be created. So the question is, do you grape under pressure or do you diamond under pressure? I like, personally, I like the word impetus. When I'm coaching somebody, what I'm looking to do is not force, not pressure, but actually give that person impetus, which in Latin means to have momentum, to have force to move forward, to really tap into your power. So how, and as, as a coach, right, or when you're working with somebody, whatever you're doing, we should always be looking for how can I create impetus in, that, in this situation to give us the power, the momentum, the speed, the velocity to achieve what it is that we're looking to achieve. Now, the last thing I'll say is that in the empowerment dynamic, the rescuer is no longer giving fish and making the person reliant on, on if I'm the rescuer, I'm, you know, you got to come to me to eat. You know that saying, you teach a person to fish, they're going to eat the rest of their life, right? So I'm no longer coming in to rescue you. I'm, I'm here to provide tools and bring it out from within you. The original word education actually means to bring out from within. And so I'm not, you're not relying on me for anything. I'm just here to give you the tools to tap into whatever it is, you know, inside of yourself to be self-reliant, self-sufficient. But this only works if you're in your creator consciousness, creator dynamic. Because if you're in your victim dynamic, if you're in your victim consciousness, everybody, everything that everybody says is an attack on you. But if you're in your creator consciousness, somebody can come and slap you in the face, a complete stranger. And if you're really in your power, the first place you go is, hmm, interesting, how did I create this? So I know I'm not, I chose to walk down this road that I know I shouldn't walk down. <laughs> so you know what? I'm going to walk down another road from now on, from now on right? <laughs> So, oh, so, good. so, so that's my rant. So, so, so good. I yeah. love it. David, I see your hand up. It is up. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm, okay. Thank you, Abraham. And I've, I've studied a lot of the things that you've studied and I've, and I've studied you a little bit. I had a question that I'm going to slow things down for the purpose of my question. Cause I, I think that is apropos of the question I'm going to ask you, which is, shutting off your mind and the value of slowing down and turning off your mind from all the bazillion thoughts that are in your head at a million given, given moments, not letting you focus and not letting you move to the next level. And what is the value of somehow being able to shut your mind down and reset? And I know you know a little bit about that. So can you explain that in the context of what you do or what, how you think it's beneficial? Sure. Yeah. It's a bit of a change of gears. So maybe just before we get into that, mm -hmm. is there, I just want to make sure that, you know, does anybody have any questions on the whole victim triangle, victim to empowerment dynamic before One we get into that I actually wanted to tap on with that was I have seen people really, really dig in their heels of when they're victim and the amount of work it takes to stay victim is actually harder than doing the other work. Mm -hmm. So like the, the hunkered down insanity of as if the other side is easier right. is so right. asinine to me. Right. Well, there's that saying that if you, if you're arguing and fighting for your limitations, you get to keep them. <laughs> you want them that, that hard for it. Right. You want them that bad. And that's the thing. And that's, the, that's the, that's a very difficult thing because huh. the thing that's held me back. And I think holds a lot of people back is this sense of, it's really what it is, is codependency, right? If you're not okay, then I'm not okay. And so I need to try to help you to get to be okay so I can feel okay. Rather than letting you, Louisa, David, so. whoever it is, letting you have your experience, whatever experience that is. And that's very difficult because a lot of times that experience is incredibly painful. It's suffering. And, and to just give you a very extreme example of this, I don't mean to get morbid, but, you know, I, a little over a month or so ago, I helped my mom. I'm such a mama's boy. I, I love her, you know, to the ends of the earth. One of the most difficult things I've had to face in my life is to help her in transitioning and dying. And 
it was never more clear and apparent this sort of codependent dynamic, that, you know, than in that process, because there would be people that it's like, no, you're going to get better or not. But there became a point, even though it's, it sounds well-intentioned, it became a point where that was about the person that was saying that, not about my mom, right? When my mom got to a place of peace and acceptance and she was like, it's my time, I'm ready to go. Anything that tried to keep her here was actually going against her, right? And you can imagine my dilemma. It's like, <laughs> you know, every impulse is like, you know, mommy, don't leave me. And yet having this sort of, the studies and, and, and the sort of just the tools that I've, I've sort of accumulated, being able to be in a place where I'm allowing her to have that end of life, even painful experience, but knowing it's because it's, it's, it's what she wanted and it's what was for her, her own benefit, her highest good. So I do want to move on to David's question, but is this related, Mary Frances, to what I just said? It, it really is because... You know, I, I did the same thing. I helped my, my father right. transition yeah. from one from you know from here to there. And you know, I think the biggest thing, and I don't know about you, is because I was there as he was leaving, it was easiest for me to accept his death than it was for other people who were just like, well, he's no longer here. One hundred percent. Yeah, I I totally get that. But thank you so much for sharing, and you know, hugs to you. Thank you. So I know David could totally relate to that because he just had that experience with his mom too. So it was so perfect to have this conversation right mm -hmm. at the same time. And and a mama's boy too. Just saying. <laughs> Why are you talking? <laughs> no. All right. Let it. <clears throat> okay. I was a daddy's girl. Yeah, my girl's a daddy's girl. Yeah, so it's a very powerful topic. But, but I do want to address your question, David. And it was around basically just, just asking me to speak on quieting the mind when you know, the mind is busy and we have all these thoughts racing. Is that right? Or was there? Yeah, no, that was right. I mean, it was, that was definitely right. And the value of it. I mean, we all know about meditation yeah. and things of that. But, you know, we have our mind racing and yep. feeding our subconscious and conscious mind, all right. these different thoughts that are going and we, you need to be able to digest and process all that. And I wanted to know what you thought, your thoughts as to the best way of doing that. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, multiple different ways. So I'll just get into theoretical and then I can offer some practical. Also. So there is, there's a guy by the name of Stephen Kotler. He, he's, you know, his background is, is being a, an extreme sports journalist. And so he's spent a lot of time with, you know, people in this sort of flow state as they're climbing, you know, the highest cliffs or, you know, riding their bike off of insane ramps and things like that. And he really fell sort of head over heels in love with this, this, this thing called flow, right? This sense of, you know, getting out of your head and getting into a place where you're at your peak, you're having a peak experience, you're enjoying the experience, but you're also delivering, you know, incredible value or you're, you know, whether you're a jazz musician or a basketball player or you're in sales or whatever you're doing, you're, you're at your best doing it. And one of the, the things that, that he highlights is something that a psychologist in, at the University of Lebanon brought up is that What's really interesting is that our prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for, you know, our 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 day to day sort of thoughts and thinking, and you know, cognitive functioning, executive functioning. I mean, we need it to survive, to get by. But when that part of our brain, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, begins to actually slow down and take a little bit of a, a back seat, then people enter into this flow state. So the sort of technological or more, you know, specific term for it is transient hypofrontality, which just basically means a slowing down of the prefrontal cortex. So the reason why it's interesting for me and for us, I believe is because, you know, whenever you're in that flow state, you're not thinking, did I leave the stove on? You're not thinking, hey, 
you know, did I wear the right shirt or is, is she looking at me funny or what are they thinking about me? Am I, you know, do I, did they, does that person like me? Right. You're, you're like, you're just in the moment and you're doing what it is that you need to do to get the job done and you really enjoy it. And so one of the things I love to do is to give people tools in order to achieve that. So now the practical side of it, a couple of things, two things, there's a lot of different things that, you know, we can do to get into these flow states. I've done a bunch of work with Tony Robbins. And so his whole thing is getting into an energy rich state or a, a peak state. And you can do that through movement, mostly through physiology, moving your body, getting, you know, he always says that motion creates emotion, which is energy and motion. It's also where am I placing my focus and my thinking and how am I using my languaging? So that's his triad. Now, for me, one of the most powerful techniques that I've come across in the last 20 years of studying the mind-body connection is something called breath work, which is, you know, there's various, it's gaining a lot of popularity. So I'm sure a lot of people have probably heard of breath work or maybe a Wim Hof or various different forms of breathing. But it's really fascinating how the way we breathe affects our physiology and can actually help us hack that transient hypofrontality. So... There's a sort of breath breathwork practice that I, you know, facilitate that even within just a few minutes of doing this intensive deep breathing, you can get into this place where all of a sudden your mind begins to calm and you shift from a sort of normal state of consciousness where your brain waves are in beta and you're just sort of like going through life just trying to survive. And then you shift into the uh, you know, the the alpha and theta. And eventually even delta brainwaves. And so that's when you get into deep sleep or deep meditation or this flow state sort of being, which is when you have your most powerful realizations and you can get more done when you're in flow because you're, you're more focused and you're more concentrated. So breath work, I, I highly recommend you check out. I mean, I even have like a free thing on my website. You're welcome to, to check that out. And it's just like a little five minute thing where you know, you do that every morning and that's one way that you can sort of prime your system for that. The other thing that I recommend, of course, is the meditation, which, you know, a lot of studies showed that what meditation helps us to do is in especially mindfulness meditation is that it helps to reduce the, the size of the amygdala in our brain. And the amygdala is the place that really triggers the fight or flight response and our fear response. And so in order to sort of bring that down and bring more balance into our nervous system and to bring our heart rate variability up, which basically is an indication of how calm, cool, and relaxed we are. It's important to have a meditation practice, but just like brushing your teeth, it's not something you do once a week or once a month or, you know, on a retreat 10 years ago, it's something that you got to do on a daily basis. And for me, ideally, I say at least two times a day. So I'm not going to tell you how to meditate. You can go and find that anywhere. But those two practices combined, the breath work and the meditation practice, is a great, great way to prime the body, to prime the mind, to really allow us to enter into that flow state more often where we're not, you know, in, in the sort of midst of our, our daily mind, which is really the response, which is really what's responsible for a lot of analysis paralysis, procrastination, and inner self-criticism. Thank you. What's the difference yeah, between breath work and meditation? So meditation is more, obviously with meditation, there's breathing, but it's a bit more, you know, you're putting yourself in a more relaxed state. Whereas breath work is work. Mm -hmm. So it's like going, if you've ever been to like a cycle class or soul cycle or something like that, you go in and you're like, you're going for it. You know, it's not, a lot of times people come into a breath work session with me and they think, oh, we're just going to sit down, do some kumbaya and, and relax and chill out. It's not like that at all. It's like, it's more like being at a Tony Robbins event where you're like full force going at it. And I'm like yelling at you and blaring loud music and getting you into this peak state. And I've had people, I mean, breath, breath work. It's one of those things. It's like trying to describe the taste of chocolate. If you've never had chocolate before. It's just one of those things that you don't really know it until you've done it. And you're like, oh, my God. I'm so wow. intrigued. I interesting, want interestingly wow. enough, I did. I was in a breathwork practice last year for a little bit of time. And it got me completely. I had a whole new appreciation for mm. things that my mother had done for me in the past. It totally connected me to all the stuff from my childhood that I had just kind of put to the side and had forgotten. 
Yep. And then it really made me thank her, which I'm very yep. glad I got to do. So gratitude is is mm-hmm. so obviously there's clarity and there's concentration and focus. And I've had people leave breath work and start like calling clients and prospects and closing mm-hmm. deals. But you know, really more immediately the the thing that a lot of people get out of it when they really do the work is it's just an overwhelming sense of peace and gratitude because what you're doing, it's almost like the way I like to think about it. It's, it's a bit like, you know, you take a soda can and you, you shake it up or like one with a twist off cap. Our logical brain, that filter, that part of ourselves is a bit like a cap on a bottle. And so we have all of this emotion and subconscious programming and all this stuff that's sort of bottled up and never really finds expression. And it's just like energy, you know, it's like, you you can't destroy energy, it just needs to be expressed in one way or the other, it needs to sort of change its shape or transformation. And so we have all of this stuff from our entire lives, until we do some sort of experience for some people, you know, breath work is the thing, right? For other people, it's going to Peru and doing a crazy like ayahuasca experience, whatever it is. But breath work is obviously you're getting high in your own supply. So it's kind of like, you know, popping the cap off of that thing that's held everything down and allowing it to come out and release from your nervous system. So people, exactly what you said, David, people experience like, hey, this thing that I completely forgot about when I was a kid, I was holding on to, all of a sudden, I'm not holding on to it anymore, right? And so people cry, people yell, people laugh, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, the reason why we do all of that craziness is because you feel so much lighter and clear headed because you're not carrying all that around with you in your subconscious mind. Say Abraham. Yes. A question. So you said you took a little break and now you are re-entering or entering again a space which you were, which you are very good at. So what is it that your expectation is of what you're going to do? and go forward with? What, what, what is motivating you? What's the impetus that's going for you right now? Sometimes you need to take a step back to take a leap forward. And what's motivating me right now is a deep appreciation for the gifts that I've been given in my life and the excitement to be able to share it with others. My purpose in life is to inspire and to empower other human beings. And it's uh, it's the excitement of being able to do that on a on a larger scale on a mass level. So bringing that down from a level of abstraction, what that means is, I I guess on a crude level, my goal with the next few years is to get to a place where I'm really just booking out speaking engagements, facilitating the breathwork practice, bringing people through this in an experience that's in like a weekend setting. But on a very more practical now level, over the last six months, I've been talking with the Tony Robbins organization and, you know, seeing if it works to do a speaker position with them. And what we've decided is, you know, right now I'm looking, exploring at, we're looking at me doing some work with another organization called Mastermind, which is co-founded by Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi. And either through Mastermind or maybe through Tony Robbins thing, being able to, to do this on a, on a much higher level. I'm a, I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. I, <clears throat> I've done Dude. many many of his uh, live events. Yeah, he's the man. He's, he's what got me into this back like 30 years ago. When I was a little kid, I was about 11 years old. I was in New York City. My parents were going through a divorce. I was getting bullied at school. And I would go to a chiropractor and he'd hang me upside down in this medieval torture device and put a, a Walkman on my head I'd be listening to Anthony Robbins, you know, talk about like, claim your power. Blah, 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 you know? And I was like, I was like, this is cool. This is cool. Like, I like 11 it. years old. Wow. I was 11 years, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. Nobody in my peer group knew who he was, but I was just like, and so anyway, that really planted a lot of seeds that really came to fruition in my 20s and 30s. Well, he is a tremendous, I mean, he's a power that's, you know, it's like, he's amazing. like a huge rock star. I mean, I, you know, I've been to an event, you know, where he's got 3,000 people and it's like, you are. Yeah, I was, I was at one just last week. When you are like that with, you know, all those people, the energy is absolutely it's spectacular. Off the charts. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, good luck. You got a small group here. I'm sure we'll all tell our friends. 
<laughs> go for it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Philip, I'd love to hear from you. I really just don't have a lot to say. I've written down quite a bit of <laughs> different things. So thank you very much, Abraham. Like, this has got me kind of reset on some things I need to look at again that I've stopped doing that I need to get back to. And that's much Beautiful. appreciation. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank what you. part of town are you in, Abraham? Are you in L.A.? No, I'm in Parkland, Florida. Parkland. Oh, yeah, my God. Outside of Boca Raton. You know, I just moved from Parkland back to L.A. Are you serious? Uh-huh. I was in Parkland, <laughs> in Heron Bay. It's across the street. I'm in Parkland Bay. That is so, wild. I grew up in Bay. Hope Sound. So what a small world. I was, I moved there 2016. And okay. I loved riding my bike in that golf course. Oh, it was beautiful. one of my favorite things to do. So beautiful. And yeah. Talk about having the wanting to have the global experience of touching people while I was riding my bike around Heron Bay, having a good old time. I was listening to Oprah and Eckhart Tolle. And he said to her, what do you like to do? And, and by the way, I like love the flat course. And I would go yeah. running there and riding my bike there. Yeah. And he said to her, what do you like to do? And she said, I like to learn. I like to teach. And my brain pops in with me too. And then my brain popped in with, who do you think you are? And I was like, what? And I, I, <laughs> it took a couple of days to process how I felt about this and then come to terms with the fact that I wasn't going to let that define me. And I wasn't mm. staying there. And I really just got to hear the backstory of what the way I talked to myself. And then a year and a half later, I'm doing another meditation. It's a guided meditation and it's about finding your purpose. And now it says, what's your purpose? And now my pop brain pops in. You ready? World leader. Mm-hmm. Next thing my brain says to me, hell yeah. As nice. opposed to anything else, it, it just went to hell yeah. Love it. I just, and I realized it doesn't make me any more special than it or one versus the other. I thought if everybody got to know who they are, we all get to change the world. We all get to step into the leadership that makes the difference of what we need versus somebody going, I don't matter enough to not claim that. I then went into, oh my God, if I could touch that many lives for people to take on world leader being their passion, then the difference we get to actually live. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's great, Louisa. Wow, it really is a small world. That's it <laughs> it's is. funny to have the, the Parkland LA connection. Yeah, my kids went to West Glades and uh, mm-hmm. we were there during the, the shooting and it sucked. Mm-hmm. But yeah. people who had even lived in Florida had never heard of Parkland. And yeah, so, right. It's like I love it's, it. It's like the most because we were in Fort Lauderdale for all of last year. So, you know, there's there's nothing like Parkland. It's like a whole other different place, oh. you know. And no other place looks like it. It's, it's just gorgeous. So it really is. It's like Pleasantville. You, you just yeah. drive around. <laughs> it's not even a real town, but it is. Yeah, exactly. That uh, is amazing. But, I didn't I was I was about to say I had no idea. The time just sort of flew. I had no idea, uh, you know, what time was. What time, how long do you guys go for usually? We kind of like usually wrap up. And then if anybody wants to continue to stay on and share, we stay on. And if you're welcome to stay on, you're welcome to call it a night because I know you're three hours ahead now. It's a little late, but I, you know, I have a few more minutes. So, you know, if there's any other questions or any, any other anything else I'm, I'm happy to stick around for a couple yeah, minutes fabulous. thank you so much this has been wonderful thank you great for me thank you guys Abraham thank you very much appreciate it yeah anyone want to say anything before well you know what you were honoring people who yes. you know, Brian Coletto who's always here in your masterminds and I see him on clubhouse all the time and always has I just want to honor him for always you know growing and, and asking good questions and and being someone that I'm always interested to see what he may bring up next. So Brian, I'm honoring you. So there you go. Even though there he is. Now he see so put on his camera, put on his face when people were talking <laughs> about him so we can see his smile. But I, you know, I see what he's doing in social media and I like it. So I'm honoring you, Brian. That is wonderful. Thank you, Brian. And that's all I got. My pleasure. Well, 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for being on. And Abraham, you gave us so much information and I'm extra excited to know exactly where you live now. And uh, I wonder who I could connect you with on that side of town because yeah, There's let me know. lots of people who definitely could use some support in mindset in that. Well, I'm, I'm sending Abraham's that. name to a few people that I know. So including myself. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, I, you know, so two things, one, cause I'm new in Parkland. I'm, I'm definitely looking to meet people and to network and just sort of get plugged in. So please, if you know anybody locally, that'd be great. And Anybody else, you know, if you if there's any other groups that you're a part of that you would like me to come and speak to, I'd be very happy to. I also, you know, because I was training for six months to be a speaker for Tony, I have an entire hour long peak performance workshop that, you know, his high level trainers lead for people, which I need to keep going over and really drilling on. So if, you know, if you guys know a group and want to bring me in to do that, feel free to reach me out. Louisa, you have my information or I can, you know, if you want, I can just drop my, my email in the chat. Is that okay, Louisa? Yeah. I was going to ask that. It's probably the easiest way to do that. That way everyone okay. gets it right away. And uh, I do have a few ideas of um, connecting you. in cool. Park That'd myself. be great. That'd be amazing. Thank you. I'm going to say good night. Good night. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good to meet you. Good night, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank Bye, you for Joe. again. Bye. And then again, lastly, go if you want that breath work, like a little, I think it still works. I haven't, like, I have not been doing anything with my list, so you're not going to even probably get any spam from me at all. But just go ahead and get that breath work practice from my website, highschoolcoaching.com, like a little five-minute thing you can do every morning. And uh, people say it's helpful, so... I love it. I can't wait to check it out. Yeah. And if I'm ever, Louisa, if I'm ever doing, I used to do online breathwork sessions. If I'm ever doing it again, I'll let you know. I would absolutely Thank love you. that. Thank you. All Thank right, you. guys. I Thank need to drop off, so but much. it's been a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. This is, this is wonderful.